Welcome to LCS Talks. I'm Berkeley Glazer, and I'm the principal of Langley Christian Middle School. I have my co-host, Kevin Merchandani, with us today again, and Kevin is our Director of Instruction for Langley Christian School, K-12. We have special guests today. We have Rachel Cram, who is the creator and owner of Wind and Tides Daycare. Um, she's also a mother of children at Langley Christian School. And we have Harmony Wilson, who is our, I'll call you Director of Early Childhood Care, mm-hmm because uh, she does everything in terms of uh, preschool, daycare for Langley Christian. So uh, welcome, and we'd just like to start off with you telling us a little bit about yourselves, your God story, how you got into early childhood education. So Rachel, we'll get you to start. Well, I was raised in a wonderful family, and when I was five years old, we moved to White Rock, and at that time, White Rock was really a senior's town, mm-hmm. and it was very small. And we landed in this little tiny church called White Rock Baptist. And at the time, I just, you know, I, it was what it was. I just went. I didn't question. But it was filled, meaning filled like 60 seniors mainly in there in the church. And they were also my Sunday school teachers. Mm-hmm. And at the time, you just go through it. You don't really realize the impact these incredible people are having on your life. They were just very, very old to me, like probably 60 or something like that. <laughs> Careful, I'm 60. I know. I'm close to that too. No, they, but I think they were, were well into their 80s, yeah. but faithful people. And there was a couple of women um, that showed up every Sunday, year after year of my childhood, really, and just gave space for us to be kids mm, in their classroom. Nice. And... They saw us, they listened to us, and I remember one time one of the kids in the class had a dog that died. That whole class, she just cried, and we heard about mm. her dog, and just created an incredible environment for me to feel known and for me to feel good. And I think that really imprinted on me, as I look back, on what I feel is so important for mm. kids, having space to just be known and to be seen and to be embraced as being good as you are for who you are. And I think both spiritually and with my view on children, that really was formative for me. Uh, Well, unlike Rachel, I grew up in three provinces. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I was all over the place. And I lived in Saskatchewan, BC, and um, Alberta. So I call myself a three province girl. So Mm -hmm. I have lots of experience in all those places and lots of different uh, schools I went to and different friends that I made. And uh, I grew up in a Christian home. My opa was a missionary in Germany, so my whole life I thought I was German, but that's not true. (laughs) He was just a missionary there. Um, And I think there was a lot of things that I grew up with that made me challenge my faith as a teenager and a young adult, and I totally strayed from Christianity as a young adult and teenager. And I think that as I reflected, I would always realize that God was always there. And it just, like, I couldn't live without that. So I think that that's eventually what brought me back to my faith. And, mm. um, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome to have you both here. And uh, just to highlight, Harmony is one of our uh, senior leadership team members, and we really appreciate her work just with direction with early learning. So um, we are talking today about early learning and the role of faith formation. And it's awesome to have uh, Rachel here as well, too. And so um, some of our listeners might uh, know of this, but Rachel's oldest son is one of my closest friends. And uh, so a bit of a shout out to her son, Brogan. And uh, I think when I think of your family, I think of the longstanding impact that you guys have been able to have on the LCS community. So it's, it's awesome to engage with you, hear about your experiences, and hear about the LCS story of, of how people in our community are impacted. So would love to hear a little bit about um, both of your experiences, starting uh, early learning centers, places where young children can thrive and, and grow, and, and uh, would love to hear about how that started. Well, I started Wind and Tide 36 years ago now in the basement of my home in White Rock. I was still mm-hmm. in White Rock all those years ago. And I think children today are still very much the same as children were back then. Children still need the same things, but society has really changed really rapidly in the last 36 years. So although children still need what children have always needed, how we deliver that is constantly changing. And one of the things that I find so incredible about being a teacher is 
the awareness that I continually have to do my own work, mm -hmm. that I continually have to keep learning and figuring out how it is that you see people and you feel people and that you let children know that they are valued, like I was saying, just as they are. And that to me has been an incredible gift of being an early mm -hmm. childhood teacher because when you can understand that for a child, you also can understand it for yourself at the same time. And I, I just feel like kids keep our feet, our kids keep our feet grounded into the truth of what it means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, it's funny when I reflect, when I took my ECE, I wasn't doing it because I love children. I was doing it to support my sister. <laughs> I wanted to be a grade three teacher. I did mm -hmm. not want to work with little people. And I remember being on my first practicum and I worked with this one lady, Amber, and this boy came up and gave her a hug and she looked at me and said, this is why I love this job. And I was mm -hmm. like, in that moment, I remember feeling like I need to embrace this and, and just see. So I feel like it was that moment on that I look at children's eyes and you just see such beauty in them. Mm -hmm. I can't, I've never seen a child that doesn't have beautiful eyes. And I just started to gain this appreciation and respect for the value that they bring and starting to admire that they are people and they need to be respected just like I expect to be respected. Mm -hmm. So do they and they should. And can, like starting this relationship and learning that I was not the only educator, they were educating me. Mm -hmm. They taught me how to be like a child, which I kind of always was, you know, hyper and fun. But <laughs> They made things simple. Like I wrote a couple Bible verses. The Bible talks so much about being like a child. And now that we're outside more with our preschool, we're now experiencing more awe and wonder of what it's like to see creation through a child's eyes. So that's what I really appreciate about them is that they make me young. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Um, Rachel, you host a podcast called Family 360. Mm -hmm. We'd love for you to share some of your key topics that you've been able to communicate and maybe some key learnings that you've uh, had from that. Hmm. Well, we're right now on about our 80th episode, so nice. it's hard to <laughs> compile that into yeah. a quick answer. But just as Harmony was talking, uh, I think a thread that has gone through a lot of our episodes is the realization that, and this is a bit back to what I said before as well, that how we raise kids is changing. Mm -hmm. And... I, I, maybe an analogy I can give is maybe the 1950s, you had, we were in the situation where dad is at work, he's working for a boss, the boss is telling him what to do. Mm -hmm. The dad comes home from work, he's the boss of the mom, he tells the mom what to do, which just makes me cringe even mm -hmm. saying that out loud. <laughs> and then the mom is the boss of the kids, she tells the kids what to do, and they obey that has all shifted and it's slowly filtered down, you know, to be a good leader, a good boss. Now you are now collaborative with mm, your team to yeah. be a, a great husband. You are now collaborative, mm -hmm. you know, you, 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 and your partnership to be great parents is I think that last unfolding stage right now that we're at is that we have realized you don't lead your child with authority of you must do this because if you lead like that children don't respond anymore they mm -hmm. have become awakened to their rights in a way if you mm -hmm. want to use that same framework of what i was referring to before so a, a thread that goes through is how do we realize that of course children have the same rights mm -hmm. that every adult has in harmony you were even saying that a little bit before i think how do you, how do we nurture? And, and that's changed. You know, I think back to people like James Dobson, who was what I grew up under with my mm -hmm. parents following him with Focus on the Family. Mm -hmm. When you listen to his teachings now, a lot of them will not, will not work for mm -hmm. children now. And we've, we've had to shift. And, and so I think now a lot of the threads that go through the podcast is listening to child psychologists mm -hmm. and experts saying, we need to be proactive with our children. We need to be collaborative with our children, and we need mm. to work with them as they develop and become who they're going to become instead of us saying, well, the Bible tells mm. us so, or, you know, this, uh, uh, do it because I told you to. That mm -hmm. just will not nurture children well, well anymore. So it's learning how to reframe as parents how we, how we are really collaborative with our mm. children while mm. still maintaining boundaries yeah do you have a favorite question that's been lingering uh from any of your talks that you keep going back to as kind of a founding question of inquiry or things that you keep thinking about and and that have been lingering on for the last couple months 
Oh, there's so many, but Dr. Gordon Neufeld is one of our first episodes, and mm-hmm. he has the phrase, you have to connect before you can direct. Mm. And I think just looking at how do you connect, and for every child that's going to be different, mm-hmm. but it's essential. And I'm sure, Harmony, you can relate to this too. If, we, if we're not connected with our kids, mm-hmm. they don't relax in our care, and they can't flourish and learn. Mm. So figuring out how to do that as an adult with any child is a challenge and it's a gift as well. I I really believe it is. Yeah, this is great. So I'd love, before we get to exploring faith formation, let's start thinking about the developmental needs. So we've got a little bit of a a firing line. So um, let's look at some insights that you both have gained from working with early learners, um, managing daycares, helping uh, not only teachers, but uh, children to thrive. Um, so I'd love to, to walk us through a bit of a firing line. Let's talk attachment, communication, and uh, building caring relationships. So we'll throw it out, kind of your your insights, attachment. That's a, a big, important concept. Gordon Neufeld talks a lot about that too. Um, what what can we share with our, our listeners in terms of building these meaningful relationships that create belonging and connection with early learners? I'd say that when we when I started ECE in 1998, um, it's evolved so much to now be so much more focused on relationship and attachment and um, connection. And like Gordon Newfeld also, they talk about how connected brains grow. So mm-hmm. you can't grow anything unless you have good soil mm-hmm. in a garden, mm-hmm. just like children and even people us as adults. We're not going to learn from each other unless we feel connected. And I think that um, the hugest shift that I've seen in all of this is to stop being, again, that that top-down teacher to just get down at kids' levels and start mm-hmm. to realize what they're interested in and start to mm-hmm. go that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Harmony. Yes to everything that Harmony just said. There's a quote by Maya Angelou, and I'm not going to nail it, Mm -hmm. but the the essence is that people will not remember what you say or what you did, but they will remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And that is the truth with anybody that we work with, but you see it with children all the time. I, you know, I think of so many times where I can just picture myself or my staff on the floor with kids, like you're just laying on the floor with them Mm -hmm. and you're, you know, your words are, are there to fill up some warmth but really they're just getting the feel of you like appreciating that you're laying on the floor with them that you are looking at them in the eye that you're relaxed like mm-hmm. what's your body like is your body posture come on get this done we gotta we're gonna move on to our next thing or is it i am just here and we can spend all the time that you want figuring out how to put this lego castle together <laughs> and that that i think that is the heart of attachment as well just children knowing or any of us feeling that the person that we're with is there to see us Mm -hmm. and not to drive an agenda. Yeah, thanks. Let's talk communication. What are some of your insights about how we communicate well, how we make sure our children are are heard, and that we have a posture of of listening and understanding? Well, I think the biggest thing in communication, even with our own children, is eye level. First of all, Mm -hmm. if we just talk about the basics, Rather than standing over like an eagle ready to eat our prey, we need to get down to their level and make them feel comfortable, first of all. Um, And I think communication isn't just verbal. It's totally in your body language. It's in your facial expression. Like in our ECE program, she's like, I want you to read a story, but look at your face in the book like Mm. or in a mirror. Watch yourself. What do you look like? And and I think that right away when we first come in, just like Rachel said, being in present with children is just how, what are we putting out there just even with our body language how are we meeting them like if you have a child that's having a hard time are you just gonna like often what we'll do is we'll lay down beside them if they're laying on the ground we just kind of lay there and match their body language and I think that that is key in communication with relationship instead of communicating verbally first I think I want to add on to your wise words there Mm -hmm. a metaphor that comes to my head is that um When you plant a seed in the ground like a carrot, the carrot is going to grow into its own shape. And often as adults, we can think we've got to shape that carrot. Like you can feel Mm -hmm. like, I want to put a mold in the ground that it'll grow to this exact shape. But I think our job in everything that we communicate to kids is to let them know they're going to grow into their own vegetable. Mm -hmm. Um, And our job Mm -hmm. is to let the sun shine down upon them, let the rain come down upon them, 
uh, let whatever manure is going to fall on top yeah. of them fall and believe that our planting of that, our being around that seed is enough mm. and that nature and God will flourish them into who they are meant to be. So I think with our communication, it is all those things, you know, I 100% agree with the eye level and the um, and the way that we relax and with kids. But I think a lot of it is just believing and, and showing it with everything that our postures and our presence that we know that the child will become, like I said, the vegetable that they are, that's not the right, their child will become the person that they are intended to be. Yeah. Thanks. That, that's really helpful. I, I think it's really important for us to think about our, our working relationship with the, the child and that God is going to do a lot of the growth. It reminds me of uh, that passage of who, who watered and who planted seed, and mm-hmm. it's, it's God and the Spirit giving growth too. So I, I love that you're leaving room for God to do that. And so I uh, would love to hear a little bit about what you're doing in your learning programs to create spaces for care, safety, and belonging. What does that look like? Well, we always make sure um, at preschool that we greet every single child that comes in the door because so often, sometimes you have so many things that happen in the day and all of a sudden you stop and look and go, oh my goodness, I haven't even talked to that child yet. Mm -hmm. And so we make an intentionality to make sure that every single child has been greeted by all of us before we even start our day. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we just spend time just being with them, playing with them or beside them and um, just building that connection and relationship again to start this safe space. Um, and then we love to just chat with them. And especially like snack time is a great time to just sit and have conversations and ask questions and listen. Letting children know that we are always here. So when there's something happening, we try to get them to think for themselves, but by mm. prompting their thoughts. So, oh, you have an issue with this, or you're having trouble zipping up your lunch kit. Oh, what could you do? So trying to make this safe space, but to get them to start to independently problem solve, like, okay, I do have a problem, and I know that I have this person I can trust, so I'm going to go to them for help with it, Mm. or getting them to start doing that with their peers too. Um, I think that that's a huge thing for safety with us, but in the first, like, all of September in preschool, we're just really getting to know these children and having this connection and so we just play a lot with them and we ask a lot of questions of like, I wonder what or I wonder how, so that they start to really feel like they're a part of our community. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so I agree with everything that Harmony just said. Yeah. And just to maybe expand it into a slightly different area to hopefully build on what you said, especially when children are in preschool, but I actually think this is true all through the grade schools, I think connection with their parents is really important Mm -hmm. as well. But especially in the preschool years, a parent is really a bridge into their safety in the school, that they see their parent as connected to the teacher, as loving the teacher, Mm -hmm. as feeling like the school is a safe and wonderful place. And I think it's important for parents to know that. When I was young growing up, if I came home and said to my parents, I don't like my teacher, they would have said, your teacher's lovely, you need to respect her. Now there was problems sometimes with that because some people mm-hmm. then found out, well, their teachers weren't that great. But I think that we have tended to move so far the other direction now that if a child comes home and says, I don't like school, or I don't like my teacher, if a parent's response is, oh no, what happened? Mm-hmm. Kids pick up on that. Mm-hmm. They pick up on, well, you're worried about this too? Mm-hmm. And so I think as parents, it's good to be aware that our connection to the, our child's teacher, our awareness of what and how they're learning, mm-hmm. and the excitement that we show for what they're experiencing is also a big part of the belonging and connection and care that they're going to feel that they have mm-hmm. when they're in their classroom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that speaks a lot to um, what's probably come up on your podcast a few times, that old adage of if we want to prepare the kids for the path or preparing the path for the kids and that, that dynamic of, of actually creating space for kids to learn and to, to try and fail sometimes mm-hmm. and, and to walk with them and, and journey. And so um, let's move a little bit to some conversation here about our, our deep hopes for children in their faith formation. Um, we've spoken to some of the developmental needs what might we encourage our listeners to be thinking about as they want to partner with what God's doing in the unique giftings and abilities of our children? And what does that look like in terms of um, the faith formation in our children? Any insights to share with us? 
just quickly, I want to add to what Rachel also mentioned mm-hmm. too, just about the importance of adults in children's lives. Like even the teachers, when they are collaboratively mentoring and supporting each other through role modeling mm. safe relationships, that also Absolutely. is a really important mm. piece, having teachers that are connected to each other. Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry. I yeah. 100% agree. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say like at the preschool, there are a lot of different person. Well, in every age, even as adults, us sitting at this table, we're not the same. We're mm-hmm. all different. We mm-hmm. all have our own personalities. We all have our own story. We all have our own beliefs and our own feelings and our own thoughts. And in children, it's the same thing, but everything as a child is so much more, I'm quoting with my fingers, simpler. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, I don't know if you ever feel like you look at a child who's just crying and screaming, you're like, man, I wish I could act like that mm-hmm. as an adult. And mm-hmm. that was appropriate because that feels good, yeah. but it's not. And um, I think... You know, it's so important to get to know each child individually so that you understand what it is that they need in in your care and how what they can contribute to the conversation. So we have some children that are naturally caregivers who will automatically start to take care of children who are maybe a little bit younger developmentally. And so we really try to nurture and support that um, when it comes to faith like building is that part of yeah faith formation development um i would say a big thing for us especially in september is we really talk about how we're all so different so Mm. this year especially we realized how many greens there are in nature there's not god didn't just make one green he made all these greens they're so different and so we take the children out and we explore these different colors of greens and maybe we bring in different greens for painting and coloring and then we sit around the circle and we look at each other's eyes Mm. and we're like okay God is not only amazing and creative, he has a huge imagination. He could have made us all look the same. He could have made our eyes the same. He could have made leaves the same shape and the same color, but he didn't. And so we're trying to celebrate so much, again, of the wonder and awe, but also just to celebrate our differences. I think that that's a huge thing, in, especially in the early years, to start to build that, that muscle, really, is the acceptance and loving of each other's differences. Yeah, thanks. Rachel, to you, any insights for supporting families and their children's I'm, faith development? I'm loving listening to Harmony. I'm thinking, oh, we've got to work more together. <laughs> uh, and I just want to maybe pick up some uh, awe and wonder that you were saying there. I, I think that we want the faith journey that we're providing to be like a safari more than like a zoo. Mm. And what I mean by that is there was a time, I think times change. I think maybe when I was younger, maybe back in the 1960s, 70s, maybe a bit earlier than that, there was a time when a faith, what I mean by a zoo is that you could take your child and say, look at exhibit A. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what we're looking at right now. We're looking at this, and this is how you care and feed for it. This is where we live, and this is how it works. Okay, now we're moving on to exhibit B. And I think faith did happen like that for a lot of people at certain times. And maybe it was because the world was a certain way and that worked, but that does not work for children now. I think sharing faith with children now is much more of a safari experience, bringing in words like awe and wonder, like Harmony was just using, and difference, like you were just using. We need, in my opinion, to be on a journey with our kids, not going to a zoo to look at here is Jesus here and here is God here, but to go, wow, what are we, what am I experiencing along with you? This Mm -hmm. is something where we're looking to go, what did you just notice over there? Wow. Oh my goodness, what's happening? But not to have an answer or an action plan that needs Mm -hmm. to come out of what we just saw, but to be experiencing it with wonder Mm -hmm. and not having to know the answer. And that experience, I feel the children and adults too that I'm around, they can resonate with that Mm -hmm. so much more than if we're saying, look at the monkey cage. And this is what you need to know about the monkey cage. Yeah, it seems so sterile, right? Like God's world and and wonder is is so much out there, but it's also... It, that wonders in us and so bringing the child to the to the world and bringing the world back into the child like that that dynamic relationship is key i think when it comes to engaging and and um creating mystery too and, and asking mm-hmm. those questions with children and i was thinking of even just my own son and we'd be walking and and uh there's uh, maybe i've shared this on the podcast previously but um we were walking one day and and he goes hey dad um is that worm 
thirsty and uh i'm like no this really it was a really warm day and uh he's, my son Merrick was like oh dad does he need some some water and i'm like no and then he goes oh is it sleeping and i'm like no and then he goes oh we should go get mama right and i'm like uh no like we're okay kind of thing and it just i mean from there i'll, I'll just cut the short the story short here but we ended up talking about life and death and and this is like my three and a half year old right and and it's just the, the questions that come from a child that's curious and the perspective that i've always held is that you keep the conversations going and you ask the questions and you invite them into that mystery and and I, th I think God got wrapped up in there too of like, is God caring for this worm? And for me, it was like this just amazing reflection of God's care for creation and care for children through the questions and the, and the mystery and the wonder that we have as well too. So I would love to, to take this conversation about faith development and probably families are asking, how do I have these rich spiritual conversations with my children? Um, how do I start that conversation I think for me, I grew up in a house that was all about the Bible stories. And mm -hmm. and in that, it is like a zoo. It's like, this is our structured way of learning about Christianity. And I find now teaching three and four-year-olds, I find so much more faith in my job because of their level of understanding and the simplicity mm -hmm. that they bring to it. So I don't think you need to get stressed at all because the more wonder and awe you have, the more your child is going to have. So the more that you were just like, oh, wow, we're making dinner tonight. Can you believe God didn't give us just <laughs> one herb? He gave us 10,000, 100 million. I don't know how many there are, but a lot. <laughs> like to a three-year-old, 10 is a big number. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so you talk about, look at in our cupboard, how many spices we had. He could have made food boring, but he didn't. Mm. He didn't choose to do that. Isn't that amazing? What an awesome God we have cares about us like that. That mm. Those things that you can just in every day find something to talk about that just, and every day I go to school and I'm like, ah, oh, I just feel even closer to God the more I'm with these children. Like I have this one little boy a long time ago and he, a grandpa had passed away and he's like, we talked about it just a tiny bit just to kind of see how he would just talk about it. And he said, yeah, you know, when you die, your thinking goes to heaven. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what a simple way mm. to explain it from his perspective. Mm. Or like yesterday, this boy unwrapped his granola bar and he called it his granola peel because <laughs> that just <laughs> made sense, right? right? So I think that we overcomplicate things as adults. And I think we need to really just simplify and realize that, again, the Bible talks about being like a child. Mm. That's mm. where you're going to find your faith. So how do we do that? Don't be stressed. Don't structure things too much. Just be, be present. God, Jesus was about relationship. So if we have a relationship with our child, we're going to be able to find those talkable moments like finding a worm on the ground. Mm. That's beautiful. It's such a good deal for me that you always start these <laughs> <laughs> questions because then I can just think and then work off of what you said. So at the beginning, you were saying it doesn't have to just be Bible stories, and I 100% agree with that. And I don't think you're going to disagree with what I say is that it is Bible stories too. Mm -hmm particularly when children are young and they want to be having you read stories to them, there are incredible books out there that do Bible stories in really engaging ways. Yeah. And I think it's choosing those ones and doing them with your children out of excitement for yourself, mm -hmm. but not to be at the end of it and say, so what did we learn today? You should not ever lie. Like, d mm -hmm. no, 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 skip mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. The moral lesson really ends it right there if you create the moral lesson, but leaving it open to, for them to figure out their own moral lesson. Because the Bible stories and parables, the parables of Jesus, for example, are incredibly well written. Mm -hmm. To try and build on them ourselves is ridiculous. <laughs> so to let ch to have children experience those parables and Bible stories with us when they're young, in mm -hmm. particular, is rich and meaningful. But yeah, yeah, I think after that, you you leave them to draw their own conclusions and trust that they will land in a place that's right for them in the environment that they're going to grow into and into a world that is incredibly different mm -hmm. than the world that we're living in as adults. And yeah, letting them just, ex letting them drink it in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we reached Rachel in um, our preschool. We started practicing the Lord's Prayer, which is a huge undertaking to do. But we decided that... Um, we wanted to bring some tradition back to Christianity also. And I find as an adult, like I used to say that all the time in my school in Saskatchewan every morning. And um, 
as an adult, when I started to learn about the Lord's Prayer and understand it, it had so much more meaning and depth, but I memorized it from childhood. So Mm -hmm. we are like, we're just going to, at snack time, we're just going to say the Lord's Prayer. And by, if they've been with us through three-year-old and four-year-old, they can start to say it. And I'm like, oh, sometimes I think this is so long, but they just start to rote memorize it. But one day our prayer is that that becomes meaning to them. And they remember, Mm -hmm. oh, I remember in preschool, we did that prayer. And now I understand more what it means. So So question you have, (laughs) what words do you use when you say, forgive us our, you say trespasses, our debts, our sins? What do you use? Because for me, I'm in my sixth decade of life. And so we learned (laughs) King James Version. And so you use trespasses? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because, um, yes, what do you use with the kids? Because it's poetry and it becomes meaningful later on in your life. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm so grateful that I was encouraged to memorize Bible verses when I was Mm -hmm. younger. And a lot of that can be done with wonderful albums that are out there with Bible verses to song. Mm -hmm. But you will not get kids wanting to do that past about the age of 10. Before they're 10, you can have them memorize the Lord's Prayer. You can have them memorize Bible verses in fun ways. But after that, I think most kids are resistant. Mm. But those seeds are in their Mm. hearts by that point in time. And I remember elderly people telling me, God will use these later on in your life. And it wasn't until I was probably in my 40s that I understood what that meant. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's that we want to give up on planting those rich seeds. And that is the beauty of working with young children, that if you know how to do that well, you are, are instilling poetry and verses and thoughts that they will continue to harvest as they're older. Mm. Like, give us this day our daily bread is now my mantra. (laughs) And it really has started when I've been in my 40s that I understand, and I probably will understand it totally differently when I'm 80, but give us this day our daily bread is everything to me right now. Mm. Yeah. So true. Harmony, you uh, brought up the fact about how unique we are, are, all are as adults. And so uh, just while I have you both here, we have you at a table, um, what would be one encouragement you could give our listeners that are parents of this age group of early learners? One takeaway for them. Your child probably is either exactly like you or totally opposite. (laughs) So embrace them (laughs) for who they are. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Rachel? I would 100% agree with that. Embrace your child for who they are. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I love the invitations you've left us with, even to to play, to experience God's world, to build relationships and mm-hmm. ask questions and and be okay with some of the awkwardness maybe that comes with it and laying on the floor when your kid's having a meltdown and then them maybe coming back to you and, mm-hmm. and, and working through some of those things. I think that's pretty beautiful to see the kind of relationships that we have, the seeds being planted from such a young age. So yeah, this has been a really great conversation. Yeah. So uh, we want to thank you both for being here today with us. It's been awesome. And we want to thank our listeners for tuning in. And uh, as we've always said, we'd like to be interactive. So if you have any questions or concerns, you can shoot us an email at podcast at langleychristian.com. Thanks for listening.